Hello, I'm going to be speaking on clinical trials for patients with limited treatment options. These are my disclosures. Clinical trials for people with limited treatment options have taken on a new design that emerged from discussions held between investigators, members of the community, regulatory authorities, uh, including the uh, US FDA, uh, and the Forum for Collaborative Research that led to the development of a new guidance. Uh, this guidance was intended to allow uh, sponsors to determine the activity of novel agents while minimizing risk to participants that they may either sacrifice the few remaining drugs uh, available for use in the uh, background therapy uh, or develop resistance to the new agent. Uh, in this uh, design, uh, uh, people who are um, on a failing regimen uh, maintain that regimen while being randomized either to the new drug or placebo for a relatively brief time, uh, 10 days to two weeks, sometimes as little as seven days, uh, after which everybody is then offered the new drug uh, and adds the new background regimen. This really allows only a very short time to assess the activity of the new agent. Uh, it's recognized that long-term activity depends on the additional antiviral uh, contribution of the background regimen, uh, and then long-term follow-up uh, is continued for safety. But the primary endpoint is at just uh, uh, seven to 14 days. So let's see how this works in uh, real practice. Uh, ibilizumab is a humanized murine monoclonal antibody of uh, IgG subtype four that recognizes a unique epitope in domain two of CD4, the HIV receptor. This antibody doesn't prevent binding of HIV envelope to CD4, but inhibits post-binding events. In a phase one study we conducted uh, many years ago, uh, increasing doses of uh, ibilizumab administered as a single uh, intravenous dose led to declines of up to uh, 1.3 or 1.4 log uh, at 14 days, as you can see in this slide, with subsequent viral rebound. So the phase three study of ibilizumab uh, took a novel approach compared to other phase three studies that you may be familiar with. Uh, in this uh, design, uh, participants who had uh, a history of uh, uh, multi-drug resistant HIV uh, underwent a screening uh, phase. Uh, and then on day zero, uh, there was a seven day control period during which they were observed uh, to see just how stable was their uh, virus load. All participants then received a loading dose of 2,000 milligrams of ibilizumab. Uh, and this led to the functional monotherapy period, another seven days. And then on day 14, uh, all participants added uh, the, an optimized background regimen. Uh, participants then continued to receive uh, every other week infusions of ibilizumab uh, at the maintenance dose of 800 milligrams up until week 23. But the primary endpoint was seven days after that first dose of ibilizumab uh, at day 14. And the primary endpoint was uh, how many people achieved a half log reduction uh, in virus load. So a decrease in virus load of, of 0.5 logs or greater uh, was of course not obtained by virtually nobody during the control period. There was one uh, such individual, perhaps um, slightly more adherent to their therapy during that time uh, as compared to 33 participants or 83% during the period of uh, functional monotherapy. Uh, this, not surprisingly, was a highly uh, statistically significant difference, therefore achieving uh, the primary goal uh, of the trial. Uh, moreover, 60% uh, of the participants had as much as a one log reduction uh, during this uh, seven day uh, period. Uh, and the mean change in virus load from baseline uh, meaning the time uh, at which ibilizumab was first infused and day 14 uh, was just over one log, again, a statistically significant uh, reduction. Now, if we look at uh, uh, how many people actually achieved uh, full virologic suppression, uh, you can see that in the intention to treat population, uh, here the uh, blue gray bars are uh, mean getting to completely undetectable less than 50 copies and the red bars are less than 200 copies. Uh, between 40 and 50% of uh, participants uh, achieved an undetectable uh, virus load. Um, uh, this was uh, 
uh, more easily achievable in people who entered the study with a higher CD4 count above 50 cells per microliter uh, compared to those with very low CD4 counts. Uh, and if we look at the change in virus load by CD4 subgroup, again, you can see that those with a higher CD4 count uh, shown all the way on the right uh, in these green bars had a nearly two log reduction uh, compared to just about a, a 0.8 log reduction or so in those with very low CD4 counts. Uh, and then if we look at the change in CD4 count, uh, again, those who entered with the better preserved CD4 counts had about a 75 cell increase compared to just a, a 20 or 25 cell increase in those with the lowest CD4 counts. In terms of adverse events, um, uh, about 18% uh, uh, were considered to have had an adverse event that was related uh, to ibilizumab. Uh, there were um, uh, five participants who had to discontinue ibilizumab uh, as a result of uh, uh, adverse events, and um, uh, there were uh, four participants who uh, died, not too surprising in this very advanced uh, patient population. If you look at the adverse events themselves, uh, those that occurred in more than 5% of patients, they are, are really uh, quite mixed, and uh, uh, the sorts of uh, adverse events that are commonly seen uh, in people with uh, advanced uh, HIV disease. Well, let's talk now about another uh, new agent, also an entry inhibitor, uh, fostemzivir, uh, which is really a prodrug of temzivir. This is a first-in-class attachment inhibitor. Uh, this drug binds to HIV GP120 and does prevent uh, the attachment of GP120 to CD4, so a very different mechanism from what we were discussing with ibilizumab. Fostemzivir, uh, or the active drug temzivir, uh, is active against R5, X4, and uh, uh, dual tropic viruses. Uh, it's synergistic or, or has additive antiviral effects when used in combination with other anti-HIV drugs. And you can see uh, here the um, uh, phosphate group uh, uh, or the phosphonate group in, of the fostemzivir that is then removed uh, to uh, generate the active uh, moiety. Fostemzivir was studied uh, in the BRIGHT trial, which was the phase three uh, efficacy trial. And this trial is similar to the study we discussed for ibilizumab, but has some important uh, differences. First of all, there were two cohorts. Uh, there was a randomized cohort uh, of participants who had at least one or possibly two fully active drugs for use in a background regimen. And then there was a non-randomized cohort who had no fully active drugs to add, but who were allowed entry into the trial uh, essentially as a um, compassionate use uh, 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 offering. Uh, all, all participants had to have multi-drug resistant virus and had to be viremic. In the randomized cohort, participants were randomized three to one to either receive blinded fostemzivir uh, dosed at 600 milligrams twice daily uh, or blinded placebo while continuing on their failing regimen for an eight-day period. Uh, and then everybody uh, was uh, crossed over to open-label fostemzivir along with an optimized background regimen. In the non-randomized cohort, uh, all the participants simply received uh, fostemzivir uh, from the outset uh, with whatever regimen uh, they could uh, uh, construct. In these slides, uh, we see data for both the randomized and non-randomized uh, cohort. Uh, and um, looking at the percent of uh, participants who achieved either less than 200 or less than 40 copies per mil, uh, you see that uh, uh, initially 50% and at the end of the follow-up at 48 weeks, 62% uh, uh, in the randomized cohort achieved a virus load below uh, 40 copies and 84% achieved a virus load of less than 200 copies. In the non-randomized cohort who had um, uh, fewer options for inclusion uh, in a um, background regimen, uh, only about half of the participants managed to achieve either less than 40 or less than 200 copies uh, by week 48. Now the primary endpoint of the study was the change in virus load uh, from uh, baseline or day zero uh, to uh, uh, the um, end of the monotherapy period, uh, day eight. And what we see is that in the placebo group, uh, there was about a, a 0.17 log reduction, whereas in the uh, fostemzivir group, there was a nearly 0.8 log reduction, and that was a statistically significant difference. And therefore, the primary endpoint was reached, uh, and uh, this is why uh, fostemzivir advanced towards uh, approval. 
uh, about two thirds of the participants had a half a log reduction and uh, just over 45% achieved a one log reduction during this uh, eight day period. Uh, and then the adjusted mean uh, decrease was about uh, point logs. There was also an increase in CD4 count. Uh, this is uh, now just in those who actually uh, were uh, receiving drug. Uh, and what you can see is that in the randomized cohort, there was about 140 cell increase compared to a 64 cell increase in the non-randomized cohort. Uh, it is uh, notable that the CD4 cell increase uh, is continuous over the course of uh, 48 weeks, uh, even though the maximum virologic uh, benefit had already been uh, obtained uh, within uh, the first 12 to 24 weeks. Uh, the mechanism by which uh, this continued increase uh, occurs is uh, still under investigation. In terms of uh, adverse events, uh, again, uh, there were common uh, grade two through four uh, adverse events, so the less commonly uh, uh, severe adverse events and a relatively uh, infrequent occurrence of adverse events requiring uh, study drug uh, discontinuation. Uh, there were, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, deaths in uh, both the randomized and non-randomized cohort. Overall, 7% uh, of uh, participants uh, uh, died. Again, uh, not uh, uncommon in this uh, very treatment experienced and uh, a highly uh, advanced group of, of uh, patients. And as you look at the uh, common adverse events, uh, these are again look very similar to what we saw with uh, ibolizumab, and again are the kinds of events that occur frequently in individuals with uh, advanced HIV disease. Well, let's uh, turn finally to talk about lenacapavir, a novel agent uh, not yet uh, 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 approved for uh, treatment, uh, still in uh, study, but th that has completed its uh, phase three trial in uh, people with. Uh, 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 multi-drug resistant infection uh, and uh, highly, who are highly treatment experienced. Lenacapavir has a novel mechanism of action. Uh, this is an entry, uh, I'm sorry, this is a uh, capsid inhibitor. Uh, this drug binds to the P24 protein that uh, is the uh, GAG monomer. Uh, and uniquely for lenacapavir, it acts at several stages of the viral life cycle. Um, the capsid is uh, essential for a nuclear uh, transport as we've uh, recently learned. Uh, and so by binding to the capsid, lenacapavir can interfere with the process of uh, nuclear uh, entry as well as capsid uh, disassembly, uh, which of course is uh, needed for, uh, to liberate the um, reverse transcribed viral DNA. And then on the back end of the life cycle, uh, at the time of virus assembly and maturation, uh, lenacapavir again interferes with the multimerization of P24. Uh, so it prevents the uh, proper assembly of the virus particle uh, and uh, the proper um, uh, uh, formation of the uh, capsid core. Uh, both uh, preclinical and early phase clinical trials demonstrated uh, the uh, activity of lenacapavir. Uh, against HIV uh, and showed that uh, when uh, given as uh, single doses, uh, there was a, a significant and sustained uh, decline in virus loads. You can see that uh, here there was a nice uh, dose response with up to about a two log reduction uh, after nine days uh, following uh, the initial dosing of uh, lenacapavir uh, and uh, in vitro passage experiments led to the selection of mutations within GAG that interfere with lenacapavir binding to the target uh, P24 protein. Now the Capella study uh, used a design that is very similar to the BRIGHT design. Uh, here uh, participants had to have a multi-drug re resistant virus uh, resistant to at least uh, two agents from three uh, of four main uh, antiretroviral drug classes. And they had to have uh, two or fewer fully active agents available uh, with which to construct a background regimen. Uh, and uh, here again, uh, there were uh, participants who uh, were either uh, entered into the uh, randomized cohort uh, where they continued on their failing regimen, received either oral lenacapavir or placebo for a 14-day uh, period, and then 
uh, everybody crossed over to receive uh, continued uh, lenacapavir. Uh, in this instance, lenacapavir uh, is dosed subcutaneously. So those crossing over from placebo uh, had a, an initial oral lead-in and then uh, switched to the um, subcutaneous dosing. Uh, and in a non-randomized uh, open-label cohort, uh, they uh, received uh, an initial 14-day uh, period of oral lenacapavir uh, as followed by subcutaneous dosing uh, together with their optimized uh, uh, background regimen. Um, but there was no uh, uh, placebo, of course, in, in that uh, group of uh, participants. The primary endpoint, as in the BRIGHT study, was the, uh, uh, well, actually, this is more similar to the Ibilizumab study. The primary endpoint was the percent achieving a half log a decline in virus load. Uh, and for the lenacapavir group, 88% uh, uh, did so uh, by day 14, uh, compared to just 17% uh, in the uh, placebo group. So the primary endpoint was achieved. If we look at change in virus load, uh, you can see that uh, at day eight in the lenacapavir group, there was about a one and a half log decrease compared to about a 0.3 log a decrease in the placebo group. And then uh, at day 15, uh, the, which is the end of the um, monotherapy period or the virtual monotherapy period, there was uh, just uh, shy of a two log decrease in the lenacapavir group. Uh, and again, this uh, 0.3 log uh, decline in the control group. And that was a highly significantly, uh, a statistically significant uh, difference. Uh, there was resistance that emerged to uh, lenacapavir. Um, uh, 11 participants met criteria for resistance testing, uh, and resistance emerged in uh, uh, virus from four of those participants. The most common mutation was a mutation at uh, uh, position 66. Uh, there were, in addition, uh, mutations at uh, uh, position 67, 70, and 74. Uh, the 66, uh, 67, and 74 mutations are similar to what uh, emerged in um, uh, in vitro passage experiments. Uh, all four participants with emergent uh, resistance mutations remained on lenacapavir. Uh, three of them uh, resuppressed uh, at a later visit, uh, two without any change in their optimized background regimen. Uh, one did uh, change their uh, regimen, but one participant uh, who had no other agents uh, to add to the regimen uh, was never able to uh, uh, re-achieve uh, full virologic suppression. But none of the participants developed additional uh, resistance uh, to agents in the optimized background regimen. So in conclusion, uh, the goal of treatment for patients with complex antiretroviral treatment histories is full virologic suppression as it is for all patients. A new regimen can include two fully active drugs if at least one drug has a high resistance barrier, uh, such as dolutegravir or boosted darunavir. But new drugs, such as those we've discussed today, with novel mechanisms of action, increase the options for constructing art regimens that contain two or more active drugs and enhance the ability to fully suppress a patient's virus. Thanks for your attention.